And so I made a point of taking those words in my title for the talk and try to address them carefully and fit within the theme of the session here, which is population, has also population in it. So let's go with an overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, if I find, this is the pointer, no, yeah. This is the pointer, doo, doo, doo. here. So first of all, when I hear population, what do I think about? There's two ways of thinking about it. You could think about all the strains or individuals from a given species or genus, say humans or streptococcus or whatever. Or if you think in terms of what will be metagenomics later on in the talk, you could talk, think about the population being all the organisms that live in a given community in each environment, make it the uh, acid mine drainage area in somewhere in the world, um, some component of your mouth, a tooth, um, some niche somewhere in the soil, uh, whatever. So with this, I will tackle some of this in the initial part of the talk, talking about functional diversity. And then that kind of a community, of course, would go to the metagenomics section. So in functional di diversity, I will talk about the comparison of closely related genomes and how that leads into what we call the pan-genome concept and how the way to visualize and study these things needs a lot of integration of tools and platforms. And then for the metagenomics, again, analysis and visualization tools, resources to do more of this that you guys can go explore yourself. And then a, a practical example of uh, the study of a human microbiome that w has been done at my institute. So if we think comparative genomics, you've heard a good bit about it uh, over the talks at this meeting, but I partitioned them in two types. One type is reference-based. So what you have is you have your reference genome, make it a chromosome from a human, all the chromosomes from a given individual. Um, everything I'm going to talk about is applicable to any type of organism, whether it's eukaryotic, prokaryotic, viral, doesn't matter. You have your reference genome and you can sh show the regions from that reference genome that are shared with the other genomes that you're studying. And you show that in underlying tracks in your favorite genome browser. You've heard all about it. I don't need to tell you about it. You can go linear or circular. This is one way of doing a circular view showing diversity across a bunch of strains of different serotypes in the colors here. Um, and um, there are uh, some tools that were presented last year as well, like ACT, the Artemis comparative tool um, that shows you the links between regions that are shared across different genomes uh, based on certain criteria. All of these guys are uh, reference-based. If you go, want to be reference-independent, um, so that means you don't know who is the person that is representative of your population, which usually you don't know anyway. If you, go ref if you don't depend on this, you'll be more flexible and you can uh, have different types of foci depending on what your question is or, or what the user is trying to achieve. Um, and the importance of this approach is that it's going to be preferred for the outburst of draft genomes. So, you know, until not so long ago, everybody would do their favorite genome of their favorite species and get it to completion, get one nice bit of sequence that goes from start to end or from the origin back to the origin if it's a circular piece. But nowadays with the sequencing technologies as they are and the throughput and the lack of time and money, we just go and sequence very deeply all, a lot of genomes and we just leave them as draft genomes. So you're going to have lots of gaps, lots of misassemblies in there, uh, different varying qualities of sequence. And so you have to deal with that. And sometimes you might not even have a closed reference genome if it's one of those unculturable bugs that lives somewhere that we don't even know the name of, you know, and you're doing metagenomics, you're not going to have that luxury. So we need to be able to handle reference independent and highly broken or low quality types of genomes. So let me tell you a little bit about one of the projects we have at the Institute for Genome Sciences at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. This is the one part where I'll talk about my work. Um, and you can go read more about it at those locations, at those URLs. So this is Sybil. It's, it's geared towards the comparison of closely related strains of a species or species that are very closely related, like a bunch of streptococci, for instance. 
And again, this is applicable to any type of organism that you care about. So here we have a reference dependent type of display. And here I am showing gradients of colors. I know we shouldn't do that, or we should do that better, but I'm one of the many. Um, so anyway, we pick a reference genome, say this strain of Streptococcus pneumoniae, we color code it from yellow to blue with a gradient from start to end, arbitrary, from the origin and back to it. And then we say, how does it compare to the other genomes that we have sequenced so far? And this is a very small subset of what we have today, by the way. So what, very quickly what you do is, if a portion or a gene of, and th this one is gene-based, I will tell you about that. If a gene from this other strain is located at the same location as, and shared with the reference genome, we color coded the same color. So what you see when you look at the overall pic picture here is that overall the gradient of color is conserved. So what this tells us is that all of these streptopneumo genomes are very syntetic. The order of the sequences or the order of all the genes that are uh, being plotted here and shared with the reference is very conserved. Very quickly, this allows you to see inversions in some of the genomes, regions of diversity where some strains share this region with Tiger 4. It's a very important gene that's involved in surface attachments to host cells uh, during the invas invasive stages of, of Streptococcus pneumoniae. Some of those other strains share it. Some have genes that were located elsewhere that popped in here. Some don't have it. And this uh, display is actually interactive. So you can click on the reference anywhere, and it will take you to a zoomed view of all the genes that are in here and how they are shared with these other strains and whatnot. Now, this is reference-based. So this is kind of annoying because I don't know what's in this region and that strain, for instance. So if we want to do this without the, the constraint of having a single reference, you can have everybody be a reference. So here we have, this is another strep, group B strep, because it's in meningitis in infants. Um, and we have eight genomes here, and we made each of the eight genomes a reference. And we have all those panels. Now here, I'm showing many additional things compared to the previous view. First, several of these genomes are incomplete. They're draft genomes. And um, we had to decide how we were going to display all those contexts that, are, that make up the whole genome of those five strains. And so we again cheated here in the sense that we picked one reference. Um, it's not legible, but forget the, the name of it. And we ordered all the contexts along that reference. And the contexts that we could not order, we threw them at the end of the what, what we call pseudomolecules. So we glued the context together. And those that we could not map on a reference, we threw at the end. And what you see very quickly is usually, of course, most of those contexts that are uh, that did not map to the reference are usually not shared with the other strains. Those are the so-called strain-specific regions of those group B strep strains. Um, but this is not a very good way of doing this. If we had an interactive way or um, a dynamic way of saying, okay, I, I care about this particular strain. I want to see what's, how it shares its sequences or genes with the other guys. You make it your temporal reference for the moment, and then you throw all the contexts on it, you get them ordered on the fly, and then you, you don't have this. These guys might fit anywhere in these blood white regions, depending on who your reference at the moment is. And you want to be able to switch your references and on the fly reorder everything. So we are not doing this well right now, um, but this is something that we want to be able to, be, to achieve. The other thing that you can do with such displays is very quickly get to the nuts and bolts of, of what's going on. So the, the system is boxing regions of diversity here. So everywhere where it's conserved, it says, OK, we're, everybody has the same components here, or roughly. Some comes from somewhere elsewhere. Those might be paralogs. You've heard a lot about it today. Um, but there are major regions that are quite different. Some are shared between some strains. Some are unique to some strains. And you can very, the system will box them for you, tell you all about the contents of those, show you the details of it if you click on them. And of course, if 
this box is similar to the content of another box down there, it will number them for you and you won't have to click on every single one to find you know, the, current, the relationship between the, diver the regions of diversity between the different panels. Of course, you could do this, the, con the, the opposite of this, depending on what you're interested in. If you'd like to look at what's shared, you could be boxing the complement of this or only boxing regions that have power logs that have moved around or, shift, or shifted along the genome. So this is trying the, the first step into going into independent, uh, reference independent modes. Um, now, as I already kind of hinted but did not explain, the way you, you make such displays, you need some, some way of anchoring your sequences to each other. Um, you can do this gene-based, is, this is what we've done so far. So you say, okay, I have this protein at this location in this genome, this other protein and this at another location in the genome, but they align to each other with whatever, say, reciprocal best blast matches. So I'm, when I align this protein to all of the proteins from every other genome that, I'm care, that I care about, I hit this guy, and when this guy is aligned to everybody, it hits back. Reciprocal best match, that's one way of doing it. You find so-called orthologs or paralogs among your genomes. And then you can say, okay, this is what I'm going to use to anchor my things. Every time I have guys that are reciprocal best matches of each other, I'm going to line them up, and I'm going to draw whatever is next to it next with the rep next reciprocal best matches and so on, and your display is growing. This is how we got those gradient displays drawn. Um, the problem is the poor discrimination between orthologs and paralogs. So you saw all those changes of colors happening, and when you do detailed views, I'll show one in the next slide, you can have some messiness happening, happening where you have your guys that are aligning, but on the side you have things that don't align. And, but, so this is a problem for drawing very clean displays, but it's great for doing comprehensive protein multiple alignments, as has been presented before. Uh, in the earlier talks, you can do all your phylogenies and all the things that are good to do on sets of pro protein families. Now, if you go not gene-based, but genome-based, which is gene-independent, you go sequence, nucleotide-based, you can do whole genome multiple alignments of these things. And depending on how related those uh, entities that you're aligning are going to be, you're going to get better or worse genome, whole genome alignments, of course. Uh, certainly, you'll find the core sets of sequences that are shared where they start to differ depending on the degree it might become a gray zone. These are two of the tools you can use to do your whole genome multiple alignments. MOV, which is reference dependent, and you can check it out here. And MUGSY, a more recent one developed at our institute that's reference independent. It will take, even if you only have 100 sequences that are all made of contigs, not a single one is closed, it's going to give you a multiple uh, alignment of your whole genomes, and it's going to help you display that. So in this case, now, if we are nucleotide-based, um, we're going to use the relative position of genes on that whole genome alignment to anchor our displays. So we're going to discriminate between orthologs that are in the same regional area of the shared sequences versus the paralogs that are usually elsewhere, unless you have tandem duplications, of course. And so here we are going to discriminate between those and we're going to get much cleaner displays of uh, synteny across the different strains that we're analyzing. This also helps with the harmonization of annotations. One of the common problems these days, because of the throughput and the ease of generating sequences and the different tools for gene finding, for assignment of function, and the, the ways, the different criteria or approaches that different groups are using for doing this, you have a lot of diversity. If, if 10 different groups align, annotate the same genome, you're going to get 10 different annotations. So you have a lot of diversity in the quality and, and uh, techniques in annotation. And when you try to do your orthology or your comparisons, your displays, you, you, you get hurt by that to some extent. And so once you can tease apart, most importantly, orthologs from paralogs and true shared genes from others, you can then start looking into how those things compared. You have the actual genome alignment. 
even if the start site was predicted elsewhere, you can see that they share the same sequence, so you could have predicted the same start site for them if you had wanted. And we have developed a tool called Maxi Annotator that will help you put your finger on those things and try to get, do a better job, of, better job of harmonizing your annotation across the different genomes. This is going to be, this has been submitted to BMC Genomics, uh, BMC Bioinformatics, and hopefully will be available for you to look at shortly. Anyway, coming back to displays, this is a messy one. So this is the one where we have all the proteins that were reciprocal best matches of each other across a whole slew of genomes here. I think this is 40 or, or 50 streptococcus pneumonia genomes. And these are agglutinins. And you can see that some of them have duplicated copies next to each other. Some of, have, some of them have them shorter. This is a gap in the genome and things like that. But what this is giving us is a beautiful alignment to do phylogeny, but a really messy display um, to navigate the genomes and find structures, you know, inversions and things like that, insertions, deletions. If you use um, nucleotide-based orthology, then you get a very clean display, an alignment where you actually have a gene that's fragmented because of a gap, gap in a draft genome. The tool predicted that with a frame shift, you could go from one to the other. This is true of all the displays before as well. And your multiple alignment has a protein that um, in this genome starts somewhere. Which line is it? This is the end of it, and the beginning of it is the second line. And you see, the, we're missing very little information. But this gives you what the true orthologs will mostly, most likely be and you can study them in detail and actually, if you care, figure out what you need to do to get your full sequence for this guy. And this will give you very nice displays to study the structure of your genomes. Now, this is very basic uh, procedures for anchoring displays, and I'll come back to displays in a bit, but when you think about analyzing that many genomes, say 50, 100, 500, 1,000 genomes of pneumococci or anything else, even many humans, you know, the 1,000 the, the human project, the 10K the 10 mammals, all those things. What do you need to think about? If, if I sequence, we, we started asking ourselves this question when we were doing the group B strep project. If, if I sequence five genomes, I see some diversity. I can look at it. I see that some of the diversity is arising from phages, bacteriophages, that inf viruses that infect bacteria and things. But how many genomes do I need to sequence to figure out what's happening in the group B strep species as far as genome diversity? And so this is when we started asking ourselves, how far do we need to go to figure it out? So we, we started with something pretty basic. You sequence one genome, and you find, in this particular case, 2,200 genes on average. This is you know, one gene per KB in bacteria. You have a 2.2 meg genome on average. You get this many genes. If I sequence a second genome, how many genes have I already seen? And so in that sense, how many genes are shared between the two strains? And if I have eight, eight genomes here, every possibility, every combination of starting with one genome and adding a second, I get this many data points. But on average, the shared part of my genome is shrinking down to two, about 2,000 genes. If I add a third, it's shrinking further, a fourth, a fifth, a seventh, an eighth. And what we see here is that what we call our core genome, the set of genes, and this is gene-based, the set of genes that are present in all of the strains that we've sequenced so far is shrinking, but it's actually shrinking in, a way, in an exponential way that seems to, to, lead, to lead towards a plateau. So it seems like no matter how many more genomes we're going to be sequencing, it looks like our core genome, the sets of genes that are shared by all of the strains of group B strep will be around 1,800. And we're being quite inclusive here. The reason why we are inclusive in deciding that we've seen something already is because we want to be more, we were interested more in the new genes. So what happens if you think about it the other way around? 
If you say, if I sequence one genome, I get 2,200 genes. What about if I sequence a second? How many genes am I seeing here that I haven't seen before? And here we really want to make sure that these genes are new. So on average, a second genome will give you 150 new genes, a third about 100, a fourth about 75, and so on. And again, we're going towards a plateau, but this is where it gets a little scary because what this is telling us is that no matter, no matter how many more genomes I'm going to be sequencing here of group B strep, I'm always going to find, on average, 33 new genes. And like I said, we've been very conservative here. These things don't look anything like the genes we've seen before in all those permutations. And if we combine the core genome with the new genes that we discover, we have what we call the pan genome that's growing. So you start at 2200 again, you add a genome, the pool of genes that you've seen is going up, 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 and it doesn't seem to plateau because of this. So it keeps going up, and we actually don't know how many more group B strep genomes, strains, we need to sequence to have characterized the whole gene repertoire that this species has access to. That was weird. Okay, but so what about other species? Well, we've done it for a bunch of guys now. This is a subset of them from a a year or so ago, or maybe a couple of years now. So this is our group B strap, strap galaxy. This is now a log log plot, but what you see is that the number of new genes is not decreasing that fast. It, you know, you, you'd have to go very, very far. Remember, this is a log scale here. Go very far to have seen all of the new genes that you can discover in strap galaxy. All of the guys in green are, have a similar feature where you don't know how big their pan genome is going to be. Streptococcus pneumonia is one of them. We had many more genomes at the time, and still we don't see where this is going. Bacillus cereus um, is a soil set of organisms. It includes the bacillus anthracis that causes anthrax. And this is very much a, a, a huge pan genome. It's not, the slope of this decay is very, uh, small. This is a marine organism, Procrococcus marinus, and it's also growing and growing. E. coli is the same. As opposed to some other bugs, this is the B. anthracis clone from the B. serious group. And this guy, once you've done five genomes, you've seen it all. So as soon as you hit five genomes, the, uh, how many more are you going to sequence? And we have a bunch now you find no new genes. All you see is some SNPs between them that could matter a lot to the, to the biology of this anthrax-causing bug, but you know, its pan-genome is finite. We've seen it all with about five genomes, no more new genes. Uraplasma is similar. Streptococcus pyogenes or group A strep, the strep throat guy, in petigo, flesh-eating. Uh, after not that long, you'll have one. The slope is going down here. And Staphylococcus aureus, similar. So this, this has a lot of implications here. The green guys, they have a core genome. The core genome most likely is reflecting the core machinery that, that characterizes a species, say group B strep, E. coli, P. marinus, strep pneumo. All the machinery that makes it live the way it lives, live where it lives, and you know, cause disease the way they cause disease, for the pathogens or survive in the, in the water, <clears throat> in the community of the water for those marine bugs and things. And then you have the distributed or dispensable genome, the things that are shared by some strains but not all of them. Uh, and then you have the strain-specific genome that is characteristic of some of those individual strains that we've seen. I'm guessing that the more we sequence genomes, the fewer we'll have strain specific ones. But the dispensable genome or distributed genome is still going to be there. And this is probably reflective of some of the subsets of the strains that will have a different tropism. Uh, for example, for pathogens, if they live more under the gum of your tooth rather than your tongue or things like that, or cause disease in the meninges rather than in the lungs or in the blood or whatever. And we see that with, for example, strep pneumo. Um, but this also has, and, and these guys, of course, we have less of that going on, so they might be maybe more clonal. There, is, there could be an issue with sampling, so once we get many more genomes done, and this is happening right now at uh, astounding speed, 
we'll be able to get a much better picture of these pan genomes. But it has implication for the population structure of these guys, trying to hit on the topic of the, uh, of the session here. How do you define even a species with this? These guys, okay, we, it's pretty straightforward. We'll have seen all the genes that probably make up the species for the most part. These guys are gonna be huge gene repertoires that you have to, to think about in terms of big bubbles. And those bubbles are gonna start to overlap, coalesce. Some of those genes that are part of the distributed genome are encoded by bacteriophages or transposable elements, conjugative transposons. And so it's easy to imagine that those things are gonna be part of multiple pan genomes. And so how does that, um, how does that work with the defi definition of the species? We're probably gonna to have to revise the way we define a species. So visualization, this is pretty boring here, right? But so here is our, oops. Computer is not moving anymore. Here we go. Nope, skipped one now. This is our first attempt at visualizing the pan genome. We were trying to get a figure for a paper. So we have, if you have one genome, you see these features, two genomes, n genomes. You get your pan genome. And then you have the gnome in his pants here trying to make sense out of this mess. But more seriously, what you need to do is a lot of integration so if you start with a multiple genome alignment based or even a gene based graph and we've seen how we can visualize all these things, you, you, you're gonna have to think about your pan genome for displaying all this, but also how you can drive it into the analysis of your author locks. You can overlay expression uh, data from RNA-seq or microarrays, SNPs, variants. Um, you can move from here into annotation interfaces. This is how you can do expression uh, with those heat maps that we've heard so much about. Multiple experiment viewer to define cutoffs for what's a, uh, a statistically significant difference in level of expression, so whatever, level of relatedness. So what you want to do is have your different interfaces, Sybil being one of them, let you jump from one to the other seamlessly with different ways of interaction. They could be plugins, they could be tiered interactions, output from one talks to the input of another. Um, they could be Java web start launches from here of MEV, for instance. Here you can go into the more viewers, your RNA seq depth of sequencing and level of expression uh, in IGV. The pan genome, this is one way we had represented the core and the distributed genome. And this is for the anthrax type species where once you've seen a few genomes, you've seen it all. But for the others, you have a core dispensable, then you have this halo of strain specific genes and we just don't know how thick this is. The challenge is how can we make this an interactive display to go look into what's in the pan genome, what's in here, and how can we decorate that with this, this halo? I, I just don't know, you could overlay proteomics on this. So all of this helps you make sense of the function of the genes that you're looking at, but, but we don't really have right now a good way of displaying the depth of the information. You know, we just don't want another track in a genome browser that shows the information. I think well, we do, and this is gonna be for your overview of your data. You say, okay, I have these genes, they're shared in this many genomes, they're expressed in these conditions. Proteomics tells me that these proteins are really there and they correlate with the expression levels of the RNA, you know, and this is part of my core or distributed genome, but I wanna be able to zoom in and out of this iPad style, just like we've seen before, and we don't have that yet. So transitioning to the metagenomics side, um, we, and also thinking about integration and more, having a more systematic way of doing this, people are developing cloud virtual resources, Clover is one of them. So these are, the, Clover is a system where a whole suite of pipelines to achieve a specific goal are embedded into virtual machines that you can then run on individual computers or clouds of computers. 
So what these are is uh, essentially turn compli complicated analysis pipelines, like you know, doing prokaryotic assembly annotation and preparation for GenBank submissions, doing all the comparative computes for similar like display or, or whole genome alignments, 16S-based metagenomics, deep sequencing-based metagenomics, just sequence all the DNA that you find in a given environment or at different times in different places in different people. And what this Clover project is doing is package entire suites of analyses into push-button pipelines that you can run very easily onto computers or clouds. And what you get is you, you give them an input, usually a bunch of sequences, and you get an output, which is some basic visualization, visualization, visualizations of what your data is. And then you need to feed that into better tools, of course, that will pick it up and agglomerate everything into something that makes sense. So this is the overview of what Clover does today. Like I said, runs on either type of platforms for computing. They have multiple tracks. They have a viral track coming up soon as well. You can do your prokaryotes with references or, or non-reference based. You can do annotation, assembly, mapping, whatever, comparative pipelines. And we're going to focus on the metagenomics side for the rest of the talk. Um, so if we focus on one of those, this is the 16S pipeline. So when you do metagenomics, there's one of the questions that you can ask. Yeah, I have a community here that lives, say, in my mouth. I want to know who's there. What are the species that are present in the mouth at this particular time that I sampled it, and maybe at a different time, or sampled at different locations of the mouth? And so one of the ways to do characterization of who's there is to do 16S sequencing. So the ribosomal RNA is highly conserved, so it goes very deep into the phylogeny with very little variation. So it's easy to sequence from conserved regions of the 16S, get the viable regions that will tell us assignments to different taxa that are present in your community. So one of the pipelines in Clover is dedicated to this type of analysis. And this is a very complicated slide, but what we need to take out of this is that it's packaging three approaches, mother, uh, ribosomal database protein, and chime, which are themselves entire pipelines, to process your sequence data that you input it, press the metadata, into all sorts of analyses and get, generate some plots. So I don't want to go into the details. I will tell you a little bit about this and this. But the bottom line is that we're back to the heat maps again. So if you look at the ribosomal database project, what you do is map all the 16S sequences that you generated into a database of now over 1.5 million sequences that are in this. And so you can assign taxonomic um, groups into your sequences, and you can count them. And these heat maps uh, represent the composition of your communities at different levels, the phylum level, the order. You could do class, genus, families. And again, the color coding, as usual, is reflective of the uh, dominance of different here phyla in the different, uh, in the different samples that have been put through the analysis. So you can see that some of these samples are more rich in proteobacteria, whereas others are more rich in firmicutes. You can draw trees out of this and analyze the composition. And of course, the idea would be from here to, to maybe have a time course of these things or a comparison between the different uh, sub-niches of that environment that you're sampling. And this is where we need better displays, of course. Um, if you forget about the 16S and you just want to sequence everything that's there, you sequence all the DNA that you get in your community, then you have a different kind of problem. Um, you have to try to reconstruct all of the genomes or, I guess, metagenomes of the species that are living there. So things are going to look alike. They're going to assemble together. You have to do some gene finding or not. You can just not want to rely on this and do a blastex type analysis instead of gene finding. Assign some function and then classify again into 
diversity, what they call alpha diversity, is a diversity within a certain ecosystem or environment, a niche, versus beta diversity, which is the comparison between different ecosystems. And again, you're back to heat maps and, this is, and trees and things like that. So this is really not getting us very far. And I guess we have recurring themes all throughout these talks because what people then do is principal components analysis once again. So this is a, a study. So this is using the chime component that's in that clover, and of course you can run on its own. It's a suite of analyses that leads you into the classification of metagenomic samples. How much time do I have? Yeah, this is, I'm almost there. So this is comparison of uh, mice that have the, the, the gut microbiota from mice, mice that have been infected with human gut microbiota and comparison of gut microbiota from twins. And so this, they're color coded by type of animal and the day that the, the, micro, the, the samples were collected. And so the PC analysis will show you that different kinds of microbiota group together depending on where they're from and when they were collected. This is PCA. Here we have a, a unifrac type of view. So here we get a bit more detail on the distance of different microbiota based on the tree that's been constructed based on the sequences. And so the distances group them in different components. And you can see that depending on where they're from, they'll, they'll be more or less distant from each other in composition in bacteria that you see here. And then you can get more details on the compositions. These are so-called rare, rare, rare refraction curves. So what this is doing is when you sequence a few samples, you keep finding new species in those. You know, and so the more samples from the same community you're going to be sequencing, or the deeper you're going to be sequencing, the more you're going to find. And what you want is your rare refraction curve to flatten, which is going to tell you that you've seen most of the diversity you have in that particular environment. And so you want to have these, uh, you know, you want to look at this to make sure that you've done enough sequencing. Similar to the pan genome, you can think about the pan metagenome, I suppose. And these are. Uh, taxonomic assignments based on 16S, and you can see how they correlate between the, the different samples. These are all the other resources you can use to do analysis and viewing of metagenomics. You can get that from the talk. Um, and one very last thing, I'll skip the details, but... Um, this is one example of a metagenome that we studied. This is the human vaginal, vag vaginal microbiome. So they sampled a whole bunch of women that were healthy and wanted to see what their bacterial composition in the vagina was like. And what, what you see very rapidly is mostly it's lactic acid bacteria that are the main species in there. But when you sequence a bunch of, of women like this, you see that they have primarily different predominant lactobacilli in their uh, in that environment, and some others have different lactic acid bacteria that are not lactobacilli. And you can group them into state types, community state types, and this is the only one, again, go into 3D, please don't do that, um, visualization, but quickly. What you see is that women go through very different states over time. So you have the extreme states of the tetrahedrons are very much dominated by some lactobacteria species, and these are more of a mix, average kind of more stable community. And this woman here, over the span of, say, 15 weeks, has, been, has seen her community of bacteria in the vagina vary drastically between this extreme, that extreme, starting from a diverse community and back. And of course, this is correlated to a number of factors, um, menstruation being one of them, but other also lifestyle and, um, of course, sex and all those, thing, all, all those good things. But it's a very striking feature, and you can document this and quantify it by looking at your metagenomes. Okay, so in conclusion, for the visualization of all these data types, um, comparative genomics, metagenomes, we want seamless data processing upstream. We want some robust pipelines that you can reproduce standardized nomenclature and ontology. We haven't talked too much about that, but we need to speak the same language. 
we want tool integration and crosstalk, and I was telling Jim that maybe next time or the, ne the time after there should be a session about actually integrating these things together. Pretty displays and don't repeat the mistakes that everybody has made so far, of course. And this is the acknowledgement. This is our genomics fireworks in Siena, Italy. Uh, and these are the people who contributed to the parts from IGS that I covered, and I thank the organizers for getting me here. <laughs>